Welcome. Okay. Okay. Welcome to Fridays at One. Okay. My name is Clarice Feynman, and I'm a member of the Institute for Profes Retired Professionals. And Fridays at One is a wonderful program that we have. Um, we connect the members of the IRP with the members of the general community for an afternoon of learning and having fun. So welcome again to Fridays at One. Okay. Um, our guest today is Dr. Gary Vina, who is an authority and a recognized authority on Eugene O'Neill. Oh. Gary Vina. Oh, that's better. I'm sorry. This is my moment upon the stage, and I goofed already. So that's it. So that's it. All right. Gary Vina. I'll never be an actress, I can tell right now. Thank you for being patient with me. Okay. Dr. Gary Vina is the author of Eugene O'Neill's The Iceman Cometh, Reconstructing the Premiere, as well as other books and articles. He has moderated annual O'Neill roundtables and was a guest speaker at the Nobel Symposium in Stockholm for the O'Neill Centennial 1988. He is Professor Emeritus of Manhattan College's English Department and received the Bonus A. Fidelis Medal for Outstanding Service. Dr. Vida is currently on the faculty of the New School, School of Drama. And in 2011, he was the recipient of the New School's Distinguished University Teaching Award. And I am really very pleased to introduce you, Dr. Vina. Please come. I actually am not sure that I'm going to stand here or move around. I'd love to move around, so I'm going to get used to holding this. Can you hear me? Is this loud? Good, good. I first of all want to thank uh, uh, Michael Markowitz for this wonderful inv invitation. I'm really so, so honored, and I want to thank Clarice for making it so smooth. She seemed to have done everything so effortlessly, which is, uh, which is uh, deeply appreciated. Um, I sometimes think that uh, geography determines biography, and that somehow where you are is uh, where you're going to be and determine what will happen to you and what, what your life will become or what road you will be di directed down. Uh, and uh, this has kind of happened, these intersections in my academic life as well as my personal life involving our very great American playwright, the single, the only, American playwright who has received a Nobel Prize, which really says something very special, I think. Um, in 1988, when his 100th birthday was approaching, uh, was happening actually, the centennial year, I submitted a proposal and a syllabus to the new school. Uh, perhaps it was continuing ed for want of a better word of what, the, what, what, what program the course would be offered. And we had our fingers crossed that it would fill up and yet just a day or two before the event or the course would begin in September, I received word that we were one student short of allowing the class to happen. So it never happened. And I, I still save the blurb in the catalog as a kind of record that this was uh, documented. Uh, but I've been fortunate because a few years later, in 1994, James Lipton, Dean James Lipton, invited me on board when the Actors Studio Drama School was establishing the MFA. And it's just hard to believe that 20 years have passed, that this coming September we will be completing 20 years, but we are now the new school for drama. Uh, Dean Lipton moved on to Pace, but I was fortunate to stay on as we evolved uh, from the Actors Studio Drama School to become the new school for drama. I mention this because uh, we have this amazing discovery that students, not so much in the graduate program where I teach, but very much so in the undergraduate program that has just begun, this BFA that started in September, that while our students will know the name Arthur Miller and say, oh, death of a salesman, a number of hands go up, and we mention uh, Tennessee Williams and, uh, and all the hands go up, the glass menagerie. Whenever I mention Eugene O'Neill, not a hand goes up, not a hand, and it's happened this year. I had the opportunity to teach the hairy ape just a few weeks ago, and it was great to hear someone say, this is the best play yet. 
Uh, and, and that's a problem, and maybe it's something we can address or you know, question at the end of the presentation. Uh, uh, but uh, he does really uh, uh, amaze us in that receiving this award, O'Neill, the Nobel Award in 1936, he had actually not even written what we regard at his, as his greatest plays. Um, uh, the Iceman Cometh, A Moon for the Misbegotten, and the landmark Long Day's Journey into Night were yet to happen. And yet O'Neill in 1936 was honored by this amazing uh, uh, um, institution. Just so I can... Uh... For me, it happened in the seventh grade. Uh, my family moved to a northwest Jersey suburb, and I found myself uh, hanging out in the library a few blocks away. And one day, uh, not able to deal with the children's library, I mean, I thought, this is a coming of age. I've got to go down to where the grown-ups books are. I looked at a shelf and saw a title, Strange Interlude. And I had no idea whether it was a novel or what, and I took the book off the shelf and uh, uh, opened it and uh, d just just kind of was amazed that it, it had nine acts. And I don't know that I knew anything about the drama then. I'm sure I'd been in a school play or two. I know I had. But nine acts seemed extreme. And I do remember that it had a protagonist named Nina Leeds, L-E-E-D-S. And I thought, you know, nine acts, Nina, N-I-N-A, I bet there's a connection here. Well, there was, and I wasn't going to find that out for years to come. So, uh, oh, and the other thing about it was that regular dialogue was not so regular. Instead of a character speaking what we would regard as the dialogue that a character speaks, <clears throat> there was this kind of italicized print indicating that the character would not only be speaking a line I would come to learn, but would be speaking his or her internal thoughts a kind of stream of conscious that really marked this as a unique work. So I brought it to the front desk, and Mrs. Welsh, the librarian, said, you know, you can't take this book. It's a, this is the adult library. I have to call your home and get permission for you to take this book home. So I, I, I would think my mom picked the phone up and said, give him, the, give him the book, send him home. And the rest for me is, you know, I'm going to say, because I live with cliches and buy cliches, but the rest is history. Um, uh, I just fell in love with this, uh, with this writer. Uh, I'm, uh, in 1956, an aunt of mine asked me, what would you like for your birthday? And I had seen this little uh, blurb, the Iceman cometh, circle in the square, and this figure of O'Neill standing. He was a, ma a man who stood up for a lot of pictures. He's documented in so many photos, uh, close shots, as you can see, in the lovely, lovely uh, display downstairs, and these, and these tall shots of him standing very elegantly, kind of thing that you see on, a, on a, the page of a paperback. They still use that shot. She said, the Iceman cometh. What is that? I said, I, it's a play in the village. So we did a day's journey of getting the tickets, having dinner, and then returning a week later for the play. Well, I r was really very young, but it was transforming uh, because in that same year, and I could document the date on this, and I, I'm really, I've, I've, I've aged. <laughs> December 30th, my little diary tells me, 1957, December 30th, I saw a long day's journey into night. It had to be a Saturday matinee. I don't think in 57 there were Sunday matinees. And I went alone. My, I, my parents allowed me to attend the theater alone. And I sort of looked tall enough. And it seemed safe for me to do it. And um, there again was Jason Robards, who had been discovered just a year earlier or two years earlier in The Iceman Cometh, a man with really no actor's training, so I, I thought who had to fight his way to be Theodore Hickman Hickey in The Iceman Cometh Off-Broadway. It was a revival in 57 of, a, of what had flopped 10 years earlier. Not really flopped, but had had a, a strange reception at the old Martin Beck Theater on Broadway. But here was a revival that caught fire, and, and it caught me with it. And uh, a year later, I'm watching Robards on the stage playing the older brother in this uh, extraordinary play. Frederick March, Florence Eldritch, Bradford Dillman as the older brother Edmund, and Jason Robards, excuse me, as the younger brother. Uh, Jason was the older brother, Jamie. Uh, you know, this 
was amazing because if O'Neill's widow had honored his request that the play should be locked in a vault with Bennett Cerf guarding it carefully, <laughs> if she, Carlotta, had honored her husband's wishes, and I thank God she didn't, we would just not have O'Neill around for years and years and years. Um, because um, the Iceman uh, leading to this Broadway production of, uh, of uh, Long Day's Journey and Tonight simply brought O'Neill back to life. His, his reputation had waned considerably. Post-World War II in 1946, the world was not ready for the grimness of an Iceman cometh. Um, just simply not. Um, this is what he wrote in the, uh, it's a famous preface, a dedication to any edition of Long Day's Journey Into Night. For Carlotta, on our 12th wedding anniversary. Dearest, I give you the original script of this play of old sorrow, written in tears and blood. A sadly inappropriate gift, it would seem, for a day celebrating happiness. But you will understand. I mean it as a tribute to your love and tenderness, which gave me the faith in love that enabled me to face my dead at last and write this play. Write it with deep pity and understanding and forgiveness for all the four haunted Tyrones. The Tyrones, the name of the family in this play. These 12 years, beloved one, have been a journey into light, into love. You know my gratitude and my love. Signed, Jean Tao House, Danville, California, their, their, their home on the west coast, uh, north of San Francisco, July 22nd, 1941. So 25 years after uh, this play uh, she gave to the world in 56, and uh, if we waited and waited, we would just have to have had waited longer to meet the man. And I think uh, with his death in 1953, it became apparent to the world that this was the story of his life. And I don't think that a lack of a movie involving his life could ever come up with or compare uh, with what this play uh, gives us. Uh, I think we're all pretty smart folk and we know about it now. We know that while a play should stand on its feet, uh, this is an amazing work that demonstrates the life of an artist in relationship to his work. Uh, we meet, they're, they're the Tyrones because O'Neill's dad grew up, was born in County Tyrone. And O'Neill always said, what you must know about me at all times is the fact that I'm Irish, even though he was American born. Um, we meet four people, James Tyrone, the, the patriarch of the family, uh, his wife, Mary, the two sons, uh, Jamie and Edmund, uh, the year is 1912. They're in their new London home, Connecticut, a landmark that you can book to visit, though it's a bit in shambles. And uh, uh, it turns out there are some issues in this long day's journey into night. While it's a bright summer uh, day, morning, I should say, and everyone seems to be very happy coming down to breakfast, it appears, though, that something is not quite right. They're all concerned about their mother, his wife, and she's come back from a cure. Uh, she has been uh, injecting herself with morphine. And the hope is that she will no longer do this. But the uh, reality, despite the illusion, is that she is at it again. Her fingers are arthritic. She has them constantly running through her hair. The directions to the play take as many words, the stage directions, as the script of dialogue itself. And in the course of the play, we learn too that everyone is abusing drugs. All of the three men are alcoholics, and uh, um, Mary is injecting again in her own room, referring to the fog which protects her. Very symbolic in the course of the play. And another bit of remarkable stage-ness uh, is that the young, younger son, who is really uh, called Edmund, is Eugene O'Neill. And he has discovered or will discover that he has tuberculosis. This is completely truthful. There are no lies. 
And amazingly, it's like O'Neill's last work, sort of, not quite, but the last one, written the summer of 3940. And it had to take him his entire life to create the masterpiece. When we think, for example, of Tennessee Williams, who wrote his masterpiece the first time round, we find in the Glass Menagerie, Tennessee, revealing his story. And I, I, f I always find that, and I, I say to the students, it's amazing that the arc for one writer was so different from another, that one was so open to his feelings, his emotions, and the other dealt with clouding them and hiding them, even though O'Neill is in all of his plays, all of his plays, he was able to face the mother, the father, and the brother who had, uh, whom he had difficulty loving, but admits in this play that he does. And another striking thing that happens is that there was a third child uh, who dies in real life, in O'Neill's life. Uh, Jamie and Ella had a boy who was named Edmund, and he died of measles. And what O'Neill does is he gives, he, he refers to Eugene as the child who dies. O'Neill kills himself off in this play and takes the name of his dead sibling, Edmund. Uh, an extraordinary thing that Mary can never forgive him for. She says to Jamie, you had measles, we were on the road, but you deliberately went into the room and you touched your brother in such a way that he contracted measles, which proved to be fatal, a, a case that proved to be fatal. Uh, just a, a few words about these people. James, the father, feared the poorhouse. He watched his father in Ireland get pulled into a poorhouse. And when they came to America and he was a young man, he absolutely was stunned that his dad would abandon the wife and children and go back to Ireland. Um, uh, he, he faced this and, and bore the title of being stingy throughout the play, being a, spend, uh, a man who didn't want to spend his money, especially when it comes around to finding a, the right kind of, kind of sanatorium that, that will heal um, uh, uh, O'Neill, who was eventually healed of, of, of this uh, consumption and uh, whose alcohol, alcoholism apparently was something that was never really discussed after, but was uh, uh, healed as well. I think that's the wrong word, but, but uh, drinking was not the issue that it would remain uh, to be for his brother, uh, Jamie, uh, James Jr., and the father, of course. Uh, the father was a famous melodramatist. He was an actor in the second half of the 19th century who, with no training whatever, um, uh, could uh, really demonstrate amazing skills. Edwin Booth was uh, Othello to uh, James Tyrone's, uh, to James O'Neill's, um, Iago, and apparently, uh, as we learned from the play, uh, Booth said, my m young man, tomorrow you will be Othello and I will be your Iago, and they switched roles. We believe that they did. But he sold himself to a play, The Count of Monte Cristo. He had the novel converted into a, adapted into a play. Melodrama was the American uh, play. I mean, that's what we did in the second half of the 19th century, and he spent his life playing Edmond Dantes until he was an old man. He even filmed it, a silent film. The film was lost for 75 years, and some years ago was found in the basement of a Brooklyn apartment. So there is access, actually, to James O'Neill in a complete silent version of uh, The Count. Uh, the, 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 the brother... Uh, older son, uh, Jamie, was a, a philanderer, just simply uh, a man who could not make it on the stage. His father drove him to accompany him on tours and act with him, but he was very unhappy. But he was well read. The father amassed an extraordinary library that is the property of Long Island University. And when you read the first page and a half of Long Day's Journey Into Night, just about every single book that, is, that sits in the father's library is spelled out, spelled out directly in the text. Uh, and I always wonder, you know, when you see a production of it, if the uh, 
director is going to make sure that those those titles are on the stage, and I would hope they are. I don't think you could be, uh, you could you could trick that, even though we don't see them. I, I really think that we have to be true to this completely. Um, uh, he will uh, die of alcoholism and STD. Uh, James and be buried out of a church here on 27th Street, 26th Street, just as uh, the mother and father were wedded on 13th Street near 2nd Avenue um, in a church that still stands. Uh, they very much are landmark New Yorkers. Uh, we could talk about Edmund, who is really Eugene. He argues with his father. Uh, it's a, an amazing summer because this summer cold, Mary says, it's just a summer cold. Uh, she doesn't want to face the truth about anything regarding her life. And it's, uh, it's not a summer cold. It's tuberculosis. Uh, um, uh, the morphine was amazing. Uh, the, we, we learned that because of the pain of giving birth to Eugene O'Neill, and because the father pulled in a quack doctor, there's a, often a quack doctor in an O'Neill play, it was easy to give her the shot to ease the pain. And she stays with it for many years, even though she is uh, removed from it uh, in the last years of her life and, uh, and dies a fairly normal death, if there is such a thing. Uh, but morphine, fortunately, was removed from her life. Uh, we tend to see her at the play's center. It really is a great question to ask who is the protagonist. And if it's not the entire family, which it can be, it very much is, uh, is Mary Tyrone, because these guys, the two sons, the father, are rooting for her amazingly. Uh, she goes through the play re revealing that she's lost something. I used to have it. I've lost it. Where is it? We're never sure what it is. We think it's her faith. I think it is. Maybe it's her wedding gown. She's preoccupied with her wedding gown. Well. Yes, the, the, the men know that she's returned to her habit. And she di disintegrates. She disintegrates in a terrible way. And she says during the course of the play, the past is the present, isn't it? It's the future, too. We tried to lie out of that, but life won't let us. So the past is always the present for her. And if we were to just build character sketches around all four characters in the play, we would discover so much, so much, so much. And while we can't call it a memory, memory play in the sense that, let's say, Death of a Salesman is, where a dead brother, Ben, will come out of the jungle and talk to his brother, Willie, where we shift back and forth, back and forth in memory. This follows, in a very Aristotelian way, the unities of time, place, and action. We're really moving right through the course of a day. And it is ironic that, the, the, that, that this is a journey of light for the writer who discovers himself, but it's a journey into darkness, psychologically, metaphorically speaking, and, and realistically for this family. Um, uh, the sound of fog, the bell uh, outside on the water, the lights that are flashing so the ships can sail by, and Edmund revealing at one moment the horror, quote, of having a dope fiend for a mother of having a dope fiend for a mother. O'Neill was 13 when she ran out on the dock and tried to throw herself in the water, uh, something that it was something that he could not quite accept and maybe was a breach, uh, indicating some breach or break from the mother, which uh, is incorporated in his, in his writings. Women are often uh, uh, gods, uh, uh, not, uh, goddesses and whores at once. I, I don't even want the word goddess, I'm, I'm, I'm saying it, but uh, uh, there, it's, a, it's a dichotomy in the female character. The, the whore and the virgin, that's what I want to say. The whore and the virgin. So he imagines numerous women uh, uh, incorporating that, di that dichotomy in their very souls. And he very much, I think, starts that when he sees his mother in this condition. And, and, and he says, uh, and she says, when he says, I thought only whores took dope, she says, just listen to that awful foghorn. Why, 
Why is it fog that makes everything sound so sad and lost, I wonder? Well, just to close on this play for a while, uh, uh, he does go to the Gaylord Sanitarium, and he reads and reads and reads, and he discovers the European drama, because his dad even had those books on his shelf. He discovers Ibsen. He discovers Strindberg. He loves Strindberg. Strindberg, Strindberg, uh, the, the, the best of them all. Uh, he loves the psychology of Strindberg. And uh, um, the, the, the greatest of them all, he repeats that over and over. He even includes it in a, in a statement he writes when he connects with the Provincetown players. Uh, and at the age of 28, and he's all cleaned up and healthy, he finds himself in Provincetown, Massachusetts. I think you know the wonderful uh, world uh, where West Villagers would go in the summer, uh, particularly the artists. It was just an amazing time for everyone to act out. Uh, he, he goes up there and he finds himself rooming with some guy named Terry Carlin. And Terry notices that this uh, suitcase opens up and these, these uh, flimsy, uh, scripts fall out. And he says, what is this? What are you doing? He says, well, I write plays. These are some one act pieces. He says, yeah, listen, I'm going to tell you, they need a play tonight up the avenue or down Commercial Street. Uh, uh, Jig Cook and his wife Susan, Susan Glassbell, are doing these readings and they need a one act play. So they pull one of them out. And uh, again, it's another moment that becomes historical. They discover the Provincetown players, their poet, who writes in prose. They discover this, this man who has endless manuscripts to offer them, and they invite him back. And like uh, 1916, right here on McDougal Street, we've got this wonderful stable that's turned into a playhouse uh, just on the west side of the park, but a block further south. And um, the, the independent theater in America is born. The world of melodrama, it goes out the window because writers come in and experiment in a European way, and O'Neill is one of the first to go along. Um, they build a, an amazing plaster dome, uh, um, a cupel horizont, horizont, cupel horizont, uh, taken from Europe. It allows on this tiny stage of the Provincetown Playhouse these amazing shadows, this, the, the, the kind of largeness that um, betrays the, the, the tininess of the room of the stage that they're working with. The, the, the theater still exists. It's landmark. It's a block north now, and it's owned by NYU. You can walk by it and read the, uh, the dedication on the, uh, on the uh, outside of the theater. And uh, uh, we are amazed at what happens. O'Neill contributes to it. A lot of one actors. They last until the Depression, as a lot of things lasted until the Depression, 1929. And, uh, and O'Neill writes a series of one-act sea plays. Uh, they have been filmed as The Long Voyage Home, John Ford. They're beautiful, very realistic, almost naturalistic, slice of life-ish. And then he does this amazing jump. He writes something called The Emperor Jones. Uh, and it, it is extraordinary. He finds an elevator operator in Harlem. And he says, you're Brutus Jones. And he turns Charles Gilpin into a Broadway star, only off-Broadway. And Gilpin is replaced uh, by Paul Robeson. And there again is the amazement of O'Neill uh, starting something really big. Uh, and that leads us to Hollywood, quote unquote, when the film of, uh, of uh, Robeson as the Emperor Jones, uh, uh, you know, is in the Library of Congress of one of the all-time top 50 films forever and ever and ever. It's an expressionist play. I love expressionism. I love the experimentation that happened so briefly in New York in the 20s uh, because Broadway goes the way of realism. That's really where we have always been. Uh, and Broadway is what makes the play. It has to happen on Broadway before it gets published. That was the way for many, many decades, a number of decades. It's, it's changed a bit in the past uh, 20 years, I'd say. Plays come in from uh, other parts of America. Um, uh, a really beautiful piece in which a, uh, uh, 
a black man named Brutus Jones escapes a chain gang and so sets himself up as an emperor on an, uh, what might be a, a West uh, Indian island and uh, can only be uh, killed by the magic uh, uh, gold bullet, or silver bullet, excuse me, and will, will meet his end that way. But as he goes through the, the jungle in a literal sense, and it's really largely pure monologue slash soliloquy, O'Neill cleverly allows the tom-tom to start. Bump, 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 bump. And he begins the journey, moves around the shadows on this plaster dome ceiling. The, 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 the shots of this that exist at Lincoln Center Library are quite impressive. Uh, the tom-tom the accelerates. And it's dum 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 dum. So it's a very clever piece of theatricality that you have to have recorded or live accompanying the actor. And before the end, it's piercing us. We, which is what expressionism does. And um, and uh, uh, his, it's his heartbeat. It's clearly his heartbeat. Uh, and and we're, 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 we've actually been in the presence of this man who has made this enormous journey. Uh, to his end as, as expressionist plays or journey plays. Uh, this is followed by a second play, uh, The Hairy Ape, another journey play. It gives us Yank, Yank, every man, a Yankee. Robert Smith, he even has the name of Robert Smith, Popular Smith. We watch this man who can only belong, which is Eugene O'Neill's theme. As he could not belong, O'Neill will always invite his characters to share that kind of destiny of not belonging quite on uh, the uh, earth or in heaven, but being somewhere in the middle, as Yank says at the end, when after a journey to uh, avenge someone, a woman who has dared to call him a beast, to call him a hairy ape, is, the, uh, is uh, going to find his death at the hands of a real ape in the Bronx Zoo. So leave it to O'Neill to give us a, a man in a monkey suit who is going to strangle to death Yank. Yank. And, and we don't end on the line of his thanking the, uh, the ape, the gorilla, but O'Neill indicating in a stage direction that maybe now, quote unquote, uh, Yank finally belongs, end of quote. And uh, a moving piece, uh, a thrilling production some years ago with Willem Dafoe, the, uh, the Worcester Group, it's recorded at Lincoln Center. And, uh, and uh, Mildred, the woman that he seeks and cannot find, the woman who dared to call him this, at the end of the performance, the, the man in the monkey suit who murders Yank rips off her head, the mask, and who is it? It's Mildred. It's Mildred. So Elizabeth Lecomte had the tremendous imagination to, uh, to turn in the, uh, the, the, the woman who is, uh, who has, created this, this kind of monster and turned, turned, made the beast be her. Well, I messed that up, but it's a, a clever coup that you don't see in the film at Lincoln Center because Miss LeCompte knows that she doesn't want directors to be stealing this from her. This is not, not directed in the, uh, in the uh, script, but it's, uh, it's something I'm very, uh, moves me to think of her own imagination distorted sets in The Hairy Ape, all of this happening, and, and moving to Broadway. The Hairy Ape goes to Broadway, and Mildred is uh, replaced by an actress named Carlotta Monterey. So O'Neill meets his, uh, the woman who will be his third wife. I'm gonna say something about the wives. There's a young first wife, and it's a, we call it a shotgun marriage. He really doesn't know that he's impregnated her. The boy Eugene O'Neill Jr. will be born. He will never see that boy till the boy is 14 years old. And the boy will change his name to Eugene O'Neill Jr. He has actually been living with his mother, who has remarried. The shotgun marriage involved O'Neill being caught with a prostitute. They needed all of this to get the divorce. He really wasn't in love with Kathleen. That son, Eugene O'Neill Jr., will commit suicide at the age of 40. He will go into a bathtub and slice his wrists. He is a Harvard scholar, and his name appears in translations of Greek and Latin plays. It devastates O'Neill. There's a second marriage, Agnes Bolton. She spends a lot of years in Provincetown. She's an author herself, short story writer. Uh, they're going to give birth to two children, Una, 
the famous Una O-O-N-A, who will shock her father when at the age of 17 she marries Charles Chaplin, who is 37 years her senior and has been married numerous times and is in the midst of a painful paternity suit that is raging while they marry. He will disown her and disinherit her, disinherit her. There's a second child named Shane. He will commit suicide in his 40s. This all is very applicable to O'Neill, the father. What kind of a man is this? And uh, it's, uh, it's very clear why so much of his life is shrouded in mystery in terms of what he speaks of, although he himself, uh, around 1914, attempts a suicide right down here, 4th Street, in what was the Golden Swan Bar uh, Saloon, the setting for the Iceman Comet. But he's rescued. and. Uh, the story of that exorcism has just been found, the short play that reveals this harrowing moment in his own life. Um, we move a little bit, Pulitzer Prizes, Beyond the Horizon, Anna Christie. Anna Christie, the prostitute play, an awful way to label it. I don't apologize. But by 1930, uh, someone named uh, Greta Garbo is going to talk. She not only delivers the last MGM silent film, but she delivers its first talkie, and it's viral. I actually use that term, it's viral. Everyone sees it, it makes a fortune for MGM, and it's not a bad flick, it really is amazing. Uh, when you think that in 1930, it's like an early, early, the cameras are positioned, actors are reading from cards, uh, this is how talkies were. You could almost see the, uh, the staticness of it, despite the fact that there are some very, very moving performances in it. Um, desire under the elms, adultery, incest, infanticide. What does O'Neill do with material like this? He's lifting from Phaedra. He's lifting from Medea. He's, um, he's, for the first time, building a set, a two-story set that New York has never seen, an upper level on stage. And that's, that's just the staging. Uh, he has... Uh, he has a, uh, a stepson and the mother look through the walls longingly as, uh, as a child is born of his uh, in the course of the play. A child she will murder, misunderstanding that uh, it's the husband, the older man, who should really be out of the picture. She shows her love uh, to, uh, to uh, Eben by murdering their child. Uh, they move out of the play in a it's a farm location, and, the, and the, uh, uh, the, the sheriff says famous last words about the farm. Damn purdy, ain't it, this farm? Wish I owned it. Having no idea of what has transpired uh, in the lives of the characters who were there. And then Strange Interlude, the first uh, of O'Neill's plays, uh, this marathon play of, of a woman's life in nine acts moving from her early 20s into her late 60s, maybe late 60s. Um, the first play that's done with a dinner break, only O'Neill could ask for a dinner break. Uh, Bernard Shaw asks for dinner breaks. Now, O'Neill is international now. His works are being performed by members of the Theater Guild, Lawrence Langner. We're going to get a series of plays that allow people to get into the seats by 5 o'clock, break at 7, return at 8, and stay till 11.30. And if you dare touch a line of the play or take the blue pencil and trim it, I take the play away from you. He has serious problems liking actors, and there's a certain point where he refuses to attend uh, rehearsals. He has no respect for the people who are putting his plays together. He does something amazing with a play uh, called All God's Chill and God Wings. Uh, leave it to be an innovator. A black man is going to kiss a white woman on stage. And there are children on stage because they're, rep they're, uh, they're represented by themselves uh, as younger children. And we watch them in a, in a gorgeous staging of their marriage where they must kiss. Well, the police hear about this and the show doesn't open. They have to do a reading of it instead, and they have to get the kids out of the picture. It gets a little better, and I think we, I usually say that it's Williams, Tennessee, who allows sexuality to become palatable in the American theater, 
post-World War II, a little later than the 1920s, when O'Neill is doing this, that, that uh, Tennessee was able to, to make it palatable. For O'Neill, it's not easy, and, uh, and he has to fight. But he's innovative all the way. A weird thing about it is the white woman and the black man bear the names of Ella and Jim, who are the names of O'Neill's parents. So the scholars go at it and try to read into this. What does it all mean? And they come out with answers that are very, very um, uh, viable, acceptable, and meaningful. Um, um, Morning Becomes Electra, a beauty, early 30s play, the Theater Guild. He takes the Aeschylus Oresteia, a three-part play, a trilogy, and he brings it into Civil War setting and makes magic. Uh, these plays, this play certainly has had quite a production history. Morning Becomes Electra. Uh, there's a dinner break. Uh, it's filmed with Rosalind Russell, lots of great stars. Rosalind, they say, was expecting the Academy Award, and when her name isn't mentioned, she tears the pearls on her necklace as they go down the aisle. I love that anecdote, and I need a laugh, so, and it's supposed to be true. She's honored with, a, with an Oscar a year or two later, but uh, she's an amazing Vinnie. Uh, well, we come to the Iceman Cometh. I have to kind of uh, just stop for a second and give this a little more attention. If you go down to Fourth Street on Sixth Avenue, you'll see a plaque outside the little fence there, this little garden park. And it's the scene of where O'Neill hung out. It's uh, the Golden Swan, known as the Hell Hole, an extraordinary play that allows O'Neill for the first time to look at family, but not his mom and dad and brother, but actually the men and women around his lives. I did a master's thesis titled Prostitutes in O'Neill's Plays, which was really a discovery, because O'Neill knew them. And they appear as women in his plays. But in this play, he focuses on the men. Every male character in The Iceman has a live counterpart. Quite extraordinary. Uh, and if you walk into the park, two years ago, I was part of a, of a Com uh, commemoration. We have on the ground in that little park uh, a, a piece that describes the Iceman Cometh in particular, uh, that this was where the hellhole was, where Harry Hope, good name, dispenses booze to keep people in their illusions just in case they want to look at the sun and face reality. I think he was actually very impressed with this, uh, with this allegory of the cave, you know, of Plato where people are seeing shadows and take them for reality. He certainly was impressed with Ibsen's The Wild Duck, because when a truth-sayer comes into a play and says, I'm going to make your lives better by letting you know the truth of your family. Do you know your daughter is really not your daughter? Someone else is the father of that child, and you're better off for knowing that. Trouble, because the child will put a, put her, a bullet in her own chest at the end of Ibsen's play. No secret. And the third, of course, is Gorky's Lower Depths, that he was so inspired by Gorky, the Russian playwright of the Moscow Art Theater, that uh, where there's a Christ figure in Gorky, O'Neill is going to name Hickey Theodore Hickey, uh, Hickman, because Theos is God and Doros is gift. And this man who comes in with the truth, this man who says, hey, guys and gals, Throw your dreams out of the window and do what I have done. Discover the truth. The truth is I have murdered Evelyn, my wife, and I am free. She loved me so much I couldn't deal with her. I put a bullet in her head. It's the truth. Face the truth. Get out of here, Hickey. They all make their exits in the sun, into the sun in the third act, but by the fourth act, they're back and they're drunk. And that's the beauty of the play I saw as a kid and was so moved by, by Jason Robards, that performance is preserved, um, of The Iceman, done for PBS in 1959-60. They filmed it, play of the week. And um, here it is now, 1946, on Broadway. This was the original one that didn't have an easy time with the critics. 
Um, I had a dissertation to write in 1980, and I did some work on the Iceman, and my mentor, Michael Kirby, said, Gary, you found your topic. The only thing is you can't do a literary dissertation because the drama department now is not the drama department. We're calling it performance studies. The doctoral program at NYU in theater is called performance studies. You have to do something technical. So I, I thought, what am I going to do? I went up to Yale once, twice, three times, and finally they decided to trust me. They brought to me the prompt books for the original production, and they gave me permission to reconstruct the opening night of The Iceman Cometh in 1946 at the Martin Beck. The Martin Beck is now the Al Hirschfeld Theater. That's where Kinky Boots is playing, but it's a gorgeous house, and maybe, Maybe too big of a house for the Iceman? That's why it worked in 56, I think, and not in 46, because you felt as though you were sitting in the bar with those people. The original Circle in the Square, which started in 1952 uh, at Sheridan Square, eventually moved up towards NYU on Bleecker Street. It's now an apartment building, uh, a very tacky little building. Well, I, I wrote, I, thanks to Louis Schaefer, O'Neill's biographer, I adore a letter of introduction was written for me, and I met some of the surviving actors who were able to fill out the details, and uh, I had uh, the luck of having the dissertation uh, published, not just to sit at NYU, but to be in every library that wanted it. Um, uh, it turned out that three books honoring his 100th birthday were selected, and mine was one of those three. And uh, thank you. And then, like the next day, there's a special delivery letter, right, uh, knocking at the door in my apartment. I was living on Irving Place. I opened this letter up, and it said, "Dear Professor Vina, the American actor Jason Robards, well, because of a performance conflict in New York City, cannot attend the Nobel Symposium and talk about the Iceman Cometh." Uh, Robards, by the way, in 1988 was playing James Tyrone in a revival of Long Day's Journey and Tonight, uh, coming out of Hartford, uh, out of Long Wharf, and playing the father in Our Wilderness, which is a beautiful comedy that's a counterpart to the ice, to uh, Long Day's Journey. In other words, uh, the life O'Neill wished he led is Our Wilderness. The life he really led is Long Day's Journey. So the, write, the letter says, I am writing you to replace, I am inviting you to replace Mr. Robards by reading from your published study of The Iceman Cometh. You'll be allowed 25 to 30 minutes. Um, and this is really something. I just found this letter. I'm so glad it was sitting in a folder and I could quote it. I hope you won't think you are secondhand choice. <laughs> In fact, you would save the program, which is why we offer you a free flight from New York to Stockholm and a very comfortable hotel here for five days. <laughs> and it was a beautiful, beautiful uh, trip. And uh, oh, he said, you, it ends, you will be an invited, our invited guest. Cordially, Tom Olson, director of the Nobel Foundation. So. That was a beauty. That was a, that was a peripatia. That's the highest moment of my life, I think. Uh, no, you know, it goes like that. Up, down, up, down. It's, uh, you have rising and falling actions. I think there have been several rising uh, actions that have, uh, you know. Um, I, uh, I also got invited to uh, preface that in Belgium, speaking in Belgium, and then go to Shanghai after, uh, after, um, uh, the uh, wonderful Nobel event, because Shanghai is where Carlotta and Eugene O'Neill spent their honeymoon in 1936, uh, 37, the year after the Nobel. And um, they loved Shanghai, and somehow the Chinese loved them. The, at the Peace Hotel, there is the bedroom where they slept, and that's a landmark you have to pay extra to stay in the, in the suite where Eugene O'Neill and Carlotta stayed. And, um, and that was Shanghai in 1988. There was not one skyscraper. I'm told there are now more than 200. Just amazing what happened. Um, uh, 
two little events. We met Ingmar Bergman, the great Swedish director, uh, known for his films to us Americans, but he's really the, the director stage director at the Dramaten, and we saw a long day's journey into night in which B.B. Anderson as Mary Tyrone, not in the script, she does a tremens, she shakes, 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 and she falls right on her behind, flat, like that. And the father and the sons lift her up, they lift her up bodily from the, from the floor. And I thought, this is incredible, you know, this is, Wow, this works. There have been many interpretations of Mary Tyrone, but I've never seen her literally go into a, into a tremens and fall, which is probably true to life, the kind of homework that uh, Bergman was doing. I think Eugene O'Neill would have loved it. I think he would have. And in China, we watch students and professional actors both do some 12, 14 O'Neill pieces, and they westernized their faces completely. That was the thing that struck me. I recorded everything in notes for the Eugene O'Neill Review, and I can't locate it, and the review has no record of my documenting all of the plays. But what I do remember is that they westernized their faces. I don't even question the, the, et, the <coughs> ethics of that as I look back on it. It was just simply their wanting to be O'Neill's characters to the very bone. Um, We really have so many actors uh, talking about just kind of maybe winding down here uh, to be grateful for, not just B.B. Anderson. I have to say that I've grown up loving Colleen Dewhurst. Uh, may she rest in peace. I don't know how I have to introduce her to my students. I do have a clip I show my graduates when I discovered some years ago, and I'm sorry some of my students are hearing this, that uh, graduate students didn't recognize the name Kim Stanley. And I thought, something's wrong here. So instead of closing my theater history class in the spring by talking about directors, I thought, let me line up British actors of the 20th century and American actors. Geraldine Page was Nina Leeds in 1962. And in my mind's eye, that's how I see Nina, Geraldine Page. This was an extraordinary moment under the direction of a Panama director, a Panamanian named Jose Quintero who really is the man who inspired Carlotta to give that uh, um, script to him in 1956. And by the way, we think that uh, New York was the world premiere. Stockholm was the world premiere eight months earlier. Carlotta so respected the Stockholm, the Swedes, for O'Neill's love of August Strindberg, she gave Long Day's Journey to that theater first and then allowed it to open at the Helen Hayes Theater. That's the old Helen Hayes Theater that got hit by the wrecking ball when they were building the, Marquis, the Marriott Marquis uh, on Broadway. We lost three beautiful theaters, the Morosco, the House of Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. We lost the Helen Hayes Theater the house of Long Day's Journey into Night, and um, a little theater called the Bijou, the B-I-J-O-U, where curiously enough in the 40s, a production of Moon for the Misbegotten ran for three performances and then just left town. And that's going to be rediscovered in 1973. Jason Robards has a horrible automobile accident, fractures every bone in his face, and the doctor they call the Miracle Man puts his face together short of a seam, he grew a mustache, um, because he discovers that Lee Marvin is going to play Hickey <laughs> in the film version of The Iceman Cometh. And it's a gorgeous film, John Frankenheimer. It's an amazing flick. Uh, Robards crashes his car. He's alcoholic, badly. He says to Colleen one night while they're performing here, A Moon for This Begotten, I have no idea what happened on stage tonight. She says, you were terrific. That was it. He went through a, he went through a cure and he went and visited with her uh, a sanatoria where he could perform O'Neill, read O'Neill. He actually committed himself to selling O'Neill. He had played so many O'Neill roles, as she had in a way, that they took O'Neill, kind of becoming a 
therapeutic experience. Uh, and, and so I think of Paige, I think of Colleen, and they're documented in films. Paige is not for O'Neill. Um, I wrote some of these. Uh, uh, oh, yes, you know, Kevin Spacey, 1999. He was so good to the new school. He allowed all of us in the Actors Studio Drama School to go free anytime we wanted to see The Iceman Cometh on Broadway. It was terrific. Uh, he did this with school kids as well. Ran for about four or five months. I don't know that it's been filmed. And now, um, with the success of Nathan Lane as Theodore Hickman, Hick Hickey, uh, it's going to come to BAM in the spring of 2015. The, uh, the uh, uh, Goodman Theater production of The Iceman Cometh is going to come to Brooklyn. And I, I think it's going to wow them. Uh, it won't run open-ended. It's not coming to Broadway. It's supposed to be a BAM uh, situation. I think Nathan is just too busy. Good for him. Um, so, we talked about those marriages, uh, yeah, yeah, Agnes Carlotta, the wife, lover, nurse, the woman who really kept O'Neill alive until the end. Um, in 2007, I wrote the uh, commemoration for Arthur Penn, who was receiving an honorary doctorate, and I did some research, and I found this extraordinary statement. I didn't include it in the commencement uh, program. But we have to represent each of the six recipients. Uh, the New School is very generous with its uh, honorees. And Arthur Penn said something, and I'd love to quote it. I, I, as I said, it was not included, but it, it, it speaks very amazingly about the artist. An artist is someone to whom the world appears intolerable in reality. So he, the artist, puts it together with another order with into another order with an imaginative cohesion, puts it together into another order with an imaginative cohesion, which is one he, the artist, can live with. I think artists have probably suffered an early disorder of a very severe nature." End of quote. I think that's a powerful statement. I, I don't read it to my students. <laughs> Uh, and I think it really addresses Nietzsche's birth of tragedy, where we talk about the Apollonian and the Dionysian. I think art is the balance of both of these forces. The light, the sun, the Apollo, the Apollonian, the darkness, the Dionysian, uh, the intuitive, that art is the balance. And I think that, I think Arthur, was, uh, was also a long time actor studio director, uh, president, uh, was, uh, was aware of that. Anyway, I, um, the last days, O'Neill and Carlotta destroyed a dozen manuscripts. They burnt them in a fireplace in their apartment in Marblehead, Massachusetts. We know that's true. One of them escaped the comms of Capricorn. And uh, you probably, we wouldn't see it performed, but Yale holds it. They were burning their children, she said. Very, very painful line. They had a bad time at the end. He develops a rare nerve disease, superficially diagnosed uh, as Parkinson's. Um, I think his epitaph probably should read, but I honestly didn't jot down what it really reads. Please forgive me. But he said once, born in a hotel room, and God damn it, died in a hotel room. Uh, what I love to do is defend a playwright who writes in prose as a poet. I don't think a work of art for me exists unless it doesn't just demonstrate the human condition, but illuminates the human condition. Demonstrating, illuminating. I think poets of the theater, not poets in the theater like T.S. Eliot writing in verse, though he is a marvel, uh, will capture something that speaks eloquently. Uh, in the, towards the end of Long Day's Journey into Night, the O'Neill character who has spent some years uh, uh, seeking gold, going to Buenos Aires, working on a ship, loves the water, O'Neill loves lots of photos of him in a, in a bathing suit sitting on the shores of, uh, of uh, the dunes uh, in Provincetown, 
He says to his dad, I was set free. I dissolved in the sea, became white sails and flying spray, became beauty and rhythm, became moonlight and the ship and the high dim starred sky. I belonged without past or future, within peace and unity and a wild joy, within something greater than my own life or the life of man, to life itself, to God, if you want to put it that way. And then he says, and several other times in my life, when I was swimming out far or lying alone on the beach, I have had the same experience, became the sun, the hot sand, green seaweed anchored to a rock, swaying in the tide like a saint's vision of beatitude, like the veil of things as they seem drawn back by an unseen hand. For a second you see, and seeing the secret are the secret. For a second there is meaning, then the hand lets the veil fall and you are alone, lost in the fog again, and you stumble on toward nowhere for no good reason. He grins wryly. It was a great mistake, my being born a man. I would have been much more successful as a seagull or a fish. As it is, I will always be a stranger who never feels at home, who does not really want and is not really wanted, who can never belong, who must always be a little in love with death. His father looks up and says, very impressed, yes, there's the makings of a poet in you, all right. The touch of a poet, right? Another play of O'Neill's. And then the son says, the makings of a poet? No, I'm afraid I'm like the guy who is always panhandling for a smoke. He hasn't even got the makings. He's got only the habit. I couldn't touch what I tried to tell you just now. I just stammered. That's the best I'll ever do. I mean, if I live. Well, it will be faithful realism, at least. Stammering is the native eloquence of us fog people. Fog people. And... Uh, and that's O'Neill, a fog person. I recently did a lecture demonstration on O'Neill and film, and I called it um, uh, uh, Framing Fog People, O'Neill on Film. I thought it was clever, because <laughs> all of the characters of the films, the, the clips that were shown were all outsiders, which is uh, a nice way to belong when you're in the theater, I think, especially if you're a character on stage. I have to close by reading something that you all know, but it just seems to be the greatest thing ever in the greatest play he wrote, Long Day's Journey, and it's the last lines. I sat at the Nobel with Arvin Brown, um, the president of the O'Neill Society, may he rest in peace, uh, Fred Wilkins, who was very instrumental in helping me along, and Geraldine Fitzgerald, the great actress who directed uh, an all-black production of Long Day's Journey Tonight for Joe Papp many years ago. <laughs> Ruby D was uh, in the film version of it. And uh, Geraldine um, read this at the Nobel. She got under the light. They dimmed the house. It was very breathtaking. And she just spoke right to, the, uh, right to heaven. <laughs> uh, this is Mary. Mary Tyrone comes down dragging her wedding gown. And uh, her husband gracefully takes it from her. And she says, uh, and she's in the worst fog state she could be in with uh, a day's injections. I had a talk with Mother Elizabeth. She is so sweet and good, a saint on earth. I love her dearly. It may be sinful of me, but I love her better than my own mother because she always understands even before you say a word. Her kind blue eyes look right into your heart you can't keep any secrets from her. You couldn't deceive her, even if you were mean enough to want to. All the same, I don't think she was so understanding this time. I told her I wanted to be a nun. I explained how sure I was of my vocation, but I had prayed to the Blessed Virgin to make me sure and to find me worthy. I told Mother I had had a true vision when I was praying to, in the shrine of Our Lady of Lourdes on the little island in the lake. I said I knew, as surely as I knew I was kneeling there, that the Blessed Virgin had smiled and blessed me with her consent. But Mother Elizabeth told me that I must be more sure than that, even that, that I must prove it wasn't simply my imagination. She said, if I was so sure, then I wouldn't mind putting myself to a test by going home after I graduated and living as other girls lived, going out to parties and dances and enjoying myself. 
And then if after a year or two, I still felt sure I could come, come back to see her and we would talk it over again. I never dreamed Holy Mother would give me such advice. I was really shocked. I said, of course, I would do anything she suggested, but I knew it was simply a waste of time. After I left her, I felt all mixed up, so I went to the shrine and prayed to the Blessed Virgin and found peace again because I knew she heard my prayer and would always love me and see no harm ever came to me so long as I never lost my faith in her. That was in the winter of senior year. Then in the spring, something happened to me. Ah, yes, I remember. I fell in love with James Tyrone and was so happy for a time. Great. That's on that side, there's a person over there. Okay, right there. Thank you. you mentioned earlier that the actual characters in Iceman, they were real persons yeah. that O'Neill knew. Yeah. Could you say one or two words about some of them, especially Larry Slade and Hugo? Yeah. Uh, Larry Slade uh, is the antagonist, or maybe the protagonist. Uh, he's the realist. Uh, in the play, uh, who really wants to push illusion. <laughs> Slade, the ungrammatical form of slay, dead, because he's dead, I mean, in the play. Um, he's probably Terry Carlin, the man I mentioned earlier, who was a major alcoholic and be befriended O'Neill and stayed with him uh, th th through the end. So that's, that's who he is. Um, Emma Goldman. Don Parrott, the boy who comes in and admits that he's squealed on his mom. We never meet Emma, Emma Goldman, but the, woman, the women we don't see is uh, clearly uh, an anarchist. And it's turned out that Don Parrott, who doesn't stop talking like a parrot, <laughs> will commit suicide at the end of the play. He will throw himself out the window. Incidentally, I learned in my dissertation that the, besides the prompt book, which didn't say it, an actress then alive who understudied the three prostitutes indicated that at the end of the play, Larry ascends the stairs to throw himself out the window. So that is something that's never done in production, but was done in the original 46 production. Uh, there's Hugo Kalmar, who's based on uh, a character who would just say, you know, m just yelled, anarchy, anarchy. That's what he does. Uh, uh, I, uh, the hope is the character who is uh, Tom something who ran the bar. That was the golden swan. And, 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 and I'm blocking. There are like seven other men who uh, run through it. The women, the three women were not specifically prostitutes O'Neill knew, though he had a deep, deep humanity for the prostitutes. But, and there are beautiful ones who run through his plays otherwise. Even though Josie Hogan is not a prostitute, in A Moon for the Misbegotten, she must play the whore. And at the end, the play that redeems James, the brother, Jamie, he, he wrote a play following Long Day's Journey that understands and forgives and loves his brother. And that's a moon for the misbegotten. She must play the whore. She didn't exist, actually, as a character, even though we'd like to think he might have known someone. She's a beautiful piece of his imagination. So there are just a few of the characters that uh, were around. John Reed, who fought the Russian Revolution, tried to declare the West Village a, a state unto itself. He climbed on top of the miniature tri Arc de Triomphe, and that's like in 1918. They were all drunk. The police came and sealed it, and no more could people go up to that that was open to the public. But, but that was a, they were declaring that the village should be a state unto itself. I think it makes great sense. <laughs> Lately, I wonder, yeah. Thank you so much oh. for a wonderful talk. Oh, I have you. a question. Sure. Uh, I've heard at, that Carlotta reported that while um, Eugene O'Neill was writing Long Day's Journey and Tonight, 
he was so crippled that he had to tie the pencil or the well, pen to his fingers. Yeah. And it was so painful, and what he was writing was so painful, that she would just listen to him crying mm -hmm. as he wrote. Yes. Now, she, I don't know if this is a She facilitated a lot of the typing for him. Even as early as uh, Desire Under the Elms, he writes this play from the 20s in the tiniest squiggles because what was happening to him gradually was affecting his penmanship, even though he was articulate and alert. And the entire uh, Desire Under the Elms is on one and a half sheets of paper. I mean, it sits at the Beinecke at Yale. The, the, you ha I had to work with magnifying glass all the time. It's an extraordinary, consistent penmanship that is not legible unless you have a magnifying glass. And, and then this all disintegrates. Remember, we go to 1939. He lives till 1953. So it's not a long time that he's writing. It's all within the space of, let's say, 1917 through 1940, right? 20, 20 plus years of writing. Yes, it's a, and a lot of that in Danville, where they spent some very happy times. That's an estate that's a landmark, and the Park Service will happily take you to their beautiful, beautiful uh, estate where their dog, Blemmy, is buried. He wrote a beautiful uh, memento for his dog, a Dalmatian. Yeah. Yes. You mentioned that um, when he got the Nobel Prize, that he had had these plays that have not got much recognition. Which ones were they that, well, that led him to get yeah. the prize? What happens in 19, the prize comes in 36. Uh, there's a real dead, there's a real bad period for O'Neill. There's a play called The Great God Brown, done on Broadway. No one wants to watch actors hold masks in front of their faces and then remove the masks. You know, this is a, this is a, again, another way of showing one character's response and the voice inside. Except this was a little more complicated. It's about duality. And, and it's a wonderful piece, and colleges keep it alive. Uh, there's a play uh, in which John uh, D uh, Dynamo, the play that discovers Claudette Colbert, uh, you know, no one wants to watch uh, actor, uh, the characters pray in front of materialist dynamos on stage. But it, got, it, it was a discovery that Claudette Colbert flew right to Hollywood. The career uh, starts right at the bat. So you've got that. Then you've got the play about his, what, a marriage play. It's really reflecting Agnes Bolting, where John Loving, John is talking to Loving. So you have the character divided into two selves, played by two actors. A string of plays for the Theater Guild that could not succeed. And if it were not for uh, Joseph Wood Crutch and uh, a couple of critics who were always there to push him, uh, a big name, I'm blocking on the name of a critic who is, oh, George G. Nathan, George G. Nathan, who kept him alive during that patchy period. We've got some six or seven plays that are fascinating to read, to talk about in a serious discussion of O'Neill in class, but don't play and have very strange history. Lazarus laughed. Marco Millions, the beautiful play of the Theater Guild that uh, Elia Kazan dared to bring uh, back when they were setting up Lincoln Center. Uh, 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 Marco Millions, a play about Marco Polo. D does that work on Broadway? It's the idea that he wanted to be commercial and, uh, and that some of these plays were a bit too ambitious. We really wonder at our panels where these plays will go because everyone runs to the experimental expressionist pieces and they just live for the last three. Long Day's Journey, Touch of the Poet, uh, Moons for the Misbegotten, uh, Huey, the long one act. You can't just do those, you know, but uh, we hope that something will open up and that other plays will keep them into the 21st century. Big issue, yeah. Would you comment as, I recall, uh, t t tremendously touched me, um, uh, in Long Day's Journey t uh, into Night, where Jamie and Edmund confront one another, yes. and he says to his brother, I, you know, I didn't want you to be born or something. Yes. Would you yes. comment about yeah. that? that really there's, a, there's a scene where he says, I made you. Uh, uh, you are my Frankenstein. Actually, that's weird because the, the, the creature is not Frankenstein. The doctor is a Frankenstein. I don't know why that's not corrected. You know, that really is a serious uh, little uh, 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 
error there, but the, the, the brother took him to whorehouses. The brother taught him the literature. The brother was a, an amazing uh, uh, counterpart in growing up. And um, the brother was unfavored because the mother cursed the brother, the older brother, for killing Edmund, right, the, with measles. So uh, it's a long thing that only happens in the most alcoholic state possible. O'Neill, again, is one writer who makes alcoholism real on stage. I'm always suspicious when they go to pick the drinks up and drink and it goes nowhere. It's like a prop. But in O'Neill, alcoholism speaks very, very truthfully, as I think it does in Albee's Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? And I think it does, too, in Tracy Letts's August Osage County. I think we see how these writers pay homage to O'Neill when we look at writers. The, that book hasn't been written. The writers that owe their inspiration to O'Neill. So it's a, it's a big thing that's very accurate, according to what the biographers say about their relationship. Yeah, yeah. Good. One more. No. OK, I guess I'm the one more. Okay. Um, two points. Carlotta was alive when her children committed suicide. Carlotta was alive. The wife was alive. Was she alive? Uh, yeah. Well, the boy, 1950, Jane, uh, Eugene O'Neill Jr., 1950. Well, she was, was alive. her son and her. No, Carlotta son. never had children. But oh, she, they were devastated, of course, by the death of Eugene O'Neill Jr. Oh. That was news she had to bring to him. That was a, that's very trickily described in uh, both Arthur and Barbara Gelb's amazing biography and Louis Schaefer. Uh, oh. So they, they did know that. Shane, Shane happens, oh, well into the 70s. I don't know why I feel like Shane is more recent. Shane, yeah. Oh. Yeah, 70. And the other point is um, you mentioned Jason Robards, whom yeah. I adore yes, uh, yes. for his talents and yeah. his craziness. But um, he was in two films that are so indicative of the range yes. of his work. Uh, Parenthood, not the TV uh, series, yeah. the original movie. Yeah, he yeah. plays the father, which is a very much O'Neill kind of character. Good. He uh, uh, is not a good father. He's a drunk. He's a womanizer. Mm -hmm. He's horrible. And the other is an older film, uh, which I was telling your students here, A Thousand Clowns. A Thousand Clowns, yeah. He, uh, he created the role on Broadway in, yeah. uh, Thank you. I can't think of the playwright, uh, Conversations with my, uh, Herb Gardner, beautiful show. Uh, it was on Broadway, and he's in the movie with Barbara Harris. Sandy Dennis. In broad on Broadway and Barbara Harris on screen. Huh? Chuck, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Clarice. Thank you.